Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I am your host, Jim Posnack. I joined Wild Ones as a member of the West Cook chapter in 2016, and I became a lifetime Wild Ones member in 2020. Also in 2020, I retired from my law practice and I became a member of the Wild Ones National Board of Directors. In addition, I serve as Wild Ones Volunteer General Counsel, and I help to organize the Wild Lawyers. The Wild Lawyers are a volunteer team of Wild Ones members who are attorneys or paralegals. The Wild Lawyers' mission as volunteers is to serve Wild Ones, including the chapters. While the Wild Lawyers might be able to provide some volunteer guidance to individual Wild Ones members, such as members who have received weed ordinance citations, the Wild Lawyers cannot provide legal representation for individual members. If there are any Wild Ones members who are attorneys or paralegals and want to join the Wild Lawyers, please contact me as we would love to have you. Now on to our show. Wild Ones is excited to welcome you to tonight's online program, Weed Ordinances with Roseanne Plant, one of our esteemed wild lawyers. A few words about tonight's presentation before I tell you about Roseanne's amazing bio. This webinar is being hosted on YouTube Live. We welcome use of the chat feature during the presentation. Although we cannot answer questions you pose in the chat, at the end of Roseanne's presentation, she and I will answer some of the 40 or so questions we received during the registration for this webinar. If you would like to hide the chat box, please enter full screen mode. Links referenced in tonight's presentation can be found in the description below. Closed captioning is available and can be turned on in your settings. This program will be recorded and posted on our website and social media channels, and the link will also be emailed to all registrants in the coming days. If you are experiencing a technical issue during tonight's presentation, please email support at wildones.org. For those of you who are new to Wild Ones, we are a membership organization devoted to promoting the use of native plants and landscapes. We carry out our mission across the nation through educational programs, such as the Wild Ones Journal, Native Garden Designs, Seeds for Education Grants, and webinars like this one. At the local level, Wild Ones chapters offer programs including garden tours, mentoring, speakers, conferences, plant sales and plant exchanges, and seed collections and seed exchanges. Wild Ones currently has 67 chapters and 21 seedlings in 27 states across the nation, and we are growing. If you are not a Wild Ones member, we hope you join us and enjoy the camaraderie, support in your native plant gardening that comes with being a part of a local chapter. If, you are not, if there is not a chapter near you, please think about starting a Wild Ones seedling chapter in your area. <clears throat> Start the conversation with Wild Ones and we can help connect you with others in your area interested in starting a chapter. Programs like tonight's webinar would not be possible without generous support from all of you. Please consider donating to Wild Ones today. Or please, if you are a member, please consider uh, increasing your membership level. Wild Ones inspires and empowers people and communities across the country to transform landscapes into vibrant and vital habitats for birds, bees, butterflies, and other wildlife. Native plants with their deep roots also sequester carbon, thereby combating climate change. Together, we can continue to educate and support one another on the importance of native plants and make a positive impact on the environment. Most town cities and other municipalities have weed ordinances. Ordinances are lo local laws for those municipalities concerning what is a weed, what is not defined as a weed, and what is allowed to be grown on the property of local citizens. Roseanne Plant, an Iowa attorney and business law professor, will explain what to do if the weed police knock on your door. Roseanne will present a handy checklist to use if you are ever accused of breaking a weed ordinance. Many times, Citizens are not in violation at all, but can use the citation or a threat of a citation as a teaching moment for local government officials. Our guest tonight, Roseanne Plant, has been a Wild Ones member since March 2021. As a past city attorney, Roseanne has extensive experience not only drafting city ordinances of all kinds, but also prosecuting offenders. Thankfully, she's not doing that anymore. Roseanne truly knows what is needed to prove up a weed violation. 
Roseanne is a certified Iowa Master Gardener since 2004, having been awarded 10 year and 500 plus community service hours, lifetime achievement awards. In the fall of 2019, Roseanne received credentials and she is now an Iowa certified master conservationist. Roseanne is also a multiple winner of many gardening contests. With that, we are going to have Roseanne turn on her video. Roseanne, please turn on your video and unmute. Welcome Roseanne and thank you for presenting this valuable topic of dealing with local ordinances, which many native plant gardeners and advocates will experience at some point. We appreciate you sharing your expertise with us tonight. Folks, after the question and answer, Roseanne will make a surprise announcement that will surely interest you. So stay to the very end. Roseanne, the floor is yours. And thank you, Jim, for that wonderful, wonderful introduction. And I'm so pleased to be here this evening for a topic that I think so many people have so many questions about. So with that, we're going to get started. And hopefully everybody can see my screen. So welcome to weed ordinances this evening, everybody, and what to do when the weed police knock on your door. As Jim said, I was a city attorney for many years for the city of Sioux City. And one of my biggest tasks was actually being part of the weed police. I supervised the weed police and I also went to court when they wrote tickets. Because so many people have questions about this, and it's such a foreign concept, normally people only ask about this when they've actually received a citation. And it can cause a lot of angst and a lot of anxiety. So tonight, I want to dispel some myths, some legal myths, and also make sure that you have truly the legal information you need if the weed police knock on your door. So. What do you do? Well, as a teacher at Morningside University, and I'd like to take this opportunity to give a special shout out to my students at Morningside who are watching. We always like to give a quick guideline or a list of what to do. This is meant to be a quick step-by-step -step thing to remember if the weed police ever knock on your door. So with that said, here are the five that I will be going over this evening. First and foremost, if there's a knock on your door and there's a city official there, number one thing I tell all my clients and my students too, is don't panic. And I have a really good story, a personal story to tell you about that. So number one tonight is going to be don't panic. Number two is going to be, and this is part of my personal story, show me the law. Now, what does that mean? Show me the ordinance. Show me the local policy. Show me what I've done wrong and ask for documentation. That's the second topic we'll talk about today. Number three, know your dates. When are you supposed to appear in court or possibly a board of citizens? know the people to contact, who's in charge, who's the attorney, who is going to prosecute this case. Back in my day, I was the lady that you called. Know who you need to contact. Number three, I'm sorry, number four, read the citation and do your research. What does it say? What rule did you allegedly break? What flower is a weed in their opinion? What's going on? And when I mean do your research, I'm also encouraging people to ask for that documentation or know what city code did you break? Or was it just your neighbor didn't like your new planting? So do your research. And last, but certainly not least, is reach out to experts in the field. Reach out to local gardeners or We'll talk about the wild lawyers here. 
reach out to somebody who can calm your fears. Remember, always don't panic, number one rule, and can also lead you through this experience. Let me tell you this, as a city attorney back in the day, I had many, many duties and I did not enjoy nor relish in any way upsetting homeowners who often had a beautiful yard that just maybe wasn't quite what the neighbors thought was a beautiful yard. That was not the number one duty on my list. And so I truly, and I think this is, this is the case for city and county attorneys, they really want to work with homeowners. They really want to understand what's going on and they want to help you abate, which means take care of the situation. So that is our checklist. And I forgot to mention at the beginning that I did feature the sunflower on my slides this evening. And that is because I and the Wild Lawyers, we send warm thoughts and support to the people of Ukraine. For those of you that don't know, the sunflower is the national flower of Ukraine. And I wanted to recognize that tonight. Number one, there's nothing else on this slide except guess what? Don't panic and don't cut down your flowers. I know so many people who immediately think that this is gonna require the lawnmower to come out or the weed whacker. And so I'd like to open up with a little personal story about don't panic. All right, last summer, my husband decided that he wanted a new mailbox. And so my story is similar, but has to deal with a different type of ordinance, but you'll see the point at the end. My husband wanted a fancy new mailbox at the end of our lane. So we live in the country here in Hinton, Iowa, and we have a very long driveway, which is brand new. And we're pretty proud of that driveway. At the end of the driveway, we had a dilapidated mailbox that didn't, my husband think, match up to the nice, pretty new driveway we had. So I said, it's up to you, dear. He took bids, he did a design, he selected a contractor, and most importantly, he checked with me to make sure that the bricks matched. And then we put in a beautiful new mailbox. Now, the mailbox was finished on a Saturday and we were out of town at a family wedding. And when we returned on Monday afternoon, there was a small post-it note on our front door. And it was lovingly signed, I'm kidding on that point, but it was signed the local county director supervisor of roads. I thought, oh dear, I think I know what's happened. We didn't take a permit out. The workmen, the contractor, they missed a step and we probably owe a fine and probably a 20 or $30 ticket of some sort because we didn't get a permit. So I called the gentleman and he came down to our home and he surprisingly said to me, and this was no cheap mailbox, ladies and gentlemen, that I needed to quote, quote, immediately tear out my brand new mailbox. Now folks, this mailbox is five feet tall. It is in beautiful brick. It's cemented and it has footings, not something you can easily go and pluck out of the ground and remove. I also said, what am I supposed to do with this brand new mailbox? Make it a bird feeder or, or, or something to hold my garden gloves? I was not about to tear out a brand new mailbox. So immediately I did what? Don't panic. My husband panicked, but I didn't panic. I didn't go ahead and tear the mailbox out. Even after the county official offered to bring a county piece of equipment and tear my mailbox out. It was gonna take a piece of heavy equipment to do that. I said, no. So in addition to don't panic, under this I would be, I would put slow down, take a time out, okay? Get your facts straight, all right? Don't cut down the flowers, don't tear out the mailbox. Take a minute to find out really what the problem is. So I simply said to the inspector, what's the problem? What's wrong with my beautiful 
matching with my retaining wall, my grand staircase and my garden mailbox. What's wrong with it? And he said, well, it's a hazard. And if somebody hit it, they could get seriously hurt. I said, well, with that, I would like to see the law. This is our second point. Show me the law. I said, I'm a lawyer and I was a city attorney. And I understand if I've broken a law or what you think I've broken a law. But guess what? I want to see the law. Remember, folks, it's always an alleged violation. Never, never also admit to any of these folks that you agree with them and that you have broken the law. OK, so the first thing I said was show me the law. Show me my violation. Now. This is the interesting thing. He didn't want to write me a ticket. And I thought that was kind of strange. He said, I just want you to tear your mailbox out. I said, I'm not going to do that until you show me the law. Probably at this point, and maybe not, but probably, and I'm going to tell you from my experience as a city of Sioux City, former city attorney, we at this point would present the homeowner with a citation or a warning. Now, many times, depending on your municipality, your county, your township, or maybe even your HOA, if you live in some sort of a gated community or uh, a community that, that has some local rules, you probably, hopefully, will receive a warning first. This is a shot over the bow, as they used to say, to tell you this is what's wrong and you have maybe 10 business days, 20 business days to get this corrected. And normally they tell you what's wrong and what needs to be corrected. You can go over that and review that with them. If that is not a policy in your area, when, it, when I was a city attorney, it was, if that was ignored, then a citation was issued, an actual formal citation with a court date. So when I say, did you receive a paper copy of your ticket or violation? That's what I'm asking for. If they can't provide that, that should be your number one red flag that you're probably not in violation. And that's the second part of our story. So I said to this inspector, I'd really like to have your supervisor send me the local law that I broke. He referred to it as a safety issue. He indicated that it was not breakaway. And so therefore, perhaps if there was an accident, I would be sued and the county would be sued. And I was confused by this policy because I pointed out seven other mailboxes in our area on our road that were exactly the same or actually more substantial. They had steel poles or they were much more sturdier than our brick. He said this was a new law and they were going to enforce it with the new structures. That was another red flag. OK, new law. OK, but let's see it. I asked for that ordinance from his supervisor, never received it. I got another call about removing the mailbox. They were very persistent on this. And I said, show me the law. Well, folks, let me tell you, the law went from a law to a policy to an internal policy to what they hoped would happen the punchline here as you may have already discovered is there's nothing on the books about my mailbox nothing now at this point things got a little dicey and i think for most people who are not an attorney this part would have got scary and i hope none of you are scared but there are some municipalities and counties who like at this point, if you've held, held your ground, they wanna scare you. At this point, he said to me, the county inspector, I'm gonna turn you into the county attorney. Of course, that didn't scare me because I've been a county attorney and I know our county attorney because I'm an attorney. And I said, probably not very nicely. Oh, please do. He's a personal friend and I'd love to hear his take on this. And maybe he can show me the law. To this day, I haven't heard back, 
my mailbox is still there. And I might also like to report that I've planted a whole bunch of gorgeous tulips and irises around it. And I can't wait for them to bloom any day now as the weather gets better here in Iowa. This is a good story about number one, don't panic. Number two, don't cut down your flowers. And number three, show me the law. Show me the law and show me what I allegedly, remember you're never guilty right away, allegedly accused of. Never admit to a violation. Now, is the weed police real? Do they have authority, people say to me? And the answer is, if it's a real law and it's on the books, it is. So what is it? Is it a civil matter? Is it something that should be resolved in civil court? Or is it a criminal matter? Like I go out and I break the speeding uh, law or I run a stop sign or goodness gracious, any of those other criminal offenses people commit. Is it more criminal? What's the standard that the county attorney has to, has to meet? And for civil law, it's a much lower standard than it is for criminal law. Some of you might remember the famous case of O.J. Simpson. He was found not guilty of murder because that level is beyond a reasonable doubt, but he was found liable for wrongful death in the civil case against him that was brought by the families of his ex-wife and her friend. We had two different results because we have two standards of proof. When you think of Lady Justice and the scales, and I have some scales behind me, Okay, beyond a reasonable doubt is 99.999. And the other one is just 51%. So in we police land, where does the scale tilt? And the scale is that most municipalities, most lower district courts that hear these type of cases consider it, quote, a pseudo criminal violation, which means the person bringing the ticket against you, the city, the county, the local organization has almost a beyond a reasonable doubt level that they have to show to the judge. These are not jury trials normally. This is tried to one person, one judge. Okay. So just know that the burden is never going to be on you to prove that it's not a weed. The burden is going to be on the city, the county, or the local organization to prove that it is a weed or that you did break the ordinance. All right. So without taking you all to mini law school, I did want to show you a couple of ordinances and how you can read them. Little statutory construction lesson this evening. And I'm using actually the current, I looked it up, the current city code from the city of Sioux City. Now I'm very familiar with this city code. Actually, during my days with the city of Sioux City, I rewrote our entire city ordinance book. And I want you to know that city ordinances have to be written, have to be approved, and have to be voted in by whatever, whoever the governing body is. So when I used to write city ordinances, I would write them, take the language to the city council, they would tweak it, we would go back to committees. It's quite a process. And that is exactly why there really isn't a law about my mailbox. They would like there to be a law about my mailbox, but it takes a lot of effort and a lot of work to get a good ordinance on the books. You've got to have a dedicated lawyer who likes to write statutes, and that's pretty rare, folks, to put together a statute that really works. And why is it so difficult, people ask? And that is because when you write a law, you almost have to predict every possibility that could come out of a situation and make sure there is language in your law that covers that. So you almost have to be like a fortune teller in a bit, a little bit of a way, a legal fortune teller. What could happen? You also have to be very deliberate with the words you choose. They have to be very clear and they have to fit together. If people read an ordinance, or a local law, and it doesn't make any sense, it's not going to make sense to the judge, and the judge isn't going to hold anybody responsible under an ordinance. So with that little bit of a precursor, a little bit of a warm-up, let's take a look at some city laws.
Okay. Oh, before that though, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. The other things you need to know immediately. If it's an honest to gosh ticket, when is your first court date? You're going to have to make an appearance in court. Now, you'll have to plead guilty or not guilty. And I encourage everybody to plead not guilty immediately. Now, why do you want to do that? Well, when you plead not guilty, the judge then sets a trial date. And it's usually at least a couple weeks to maybe a couple of months in the future. With COVID, the court systems are behind. And for instance, in a lot of these smaller cases, the court dates are at least 30 to 60 to 90 days out. You need that time to get your case together. So always plead not guilty. But if you miss that first court date, you may automatically be found guilty by default. So know that court date. And a lot of times it's a, it's a very quick five minute appearance or even you can file uh, online now with a lot of jurisdictions. The other thing is you'll wanna ask who is the prosecutor? Who is your city, your county or your local person who is going to be in charge of it? Who's the attorney who's going to be doing the prosecution? You can reach out to them or if you choose to hire an attorney or find a volunteer lawyer in your area, they'll want to reach out to them about possibly working through the ticket so you don't have to go to a trial because most of the time we want to work these things out. Okay. The other thing is if you have your citation, I want you to read it carefully and fully. Does it say that you violated one or two parts? Or have you only violated one part, but perhaps you've done it two or three different ways? So for instance, maybe they feel you have a weed in one part of your yard, so you violated one ordinance, but you have three counts. Or maybe you've violated three parts of the ordinance. But that's why you need to look at the citation carefully and fully, not just to have that date, but to see what you are accused of, okay? Once again, what code or ordinance did you violate? There should be not only a code section listed, but many citations also go ahead and put the language there for you. Now, if there's only the code section, it is possible to go down to your local library or even call the prosecutor and ask them can you get me a copy of the ordinance? And we're gonna take a look at some of those here in a minute so you'll have an idea what they look like. They're very short. They're usually only a few paragraphs long. We're not talking several pages. They're, they're very short, succinct. They should be writings that they will, should be able to tell you which part that you violated, okay? And then read that code or that ordinance and compare it to the fact pattern. Every warning, or citation should say exactly what you've done wrong. You have planted plants that are seven feet tall and they're only supposed to be 12 inches tall in this area, this address for this long. There should be the basics, who, what, when, how, okay? If it's very blank or very generic, you won't know particularly what you did and once again, remember where the burden is. The burden is on the prosecuting entity. The burden isn't on you. You don't have to prove, okay, that it's not a weed. They have to prove that it is a weed. So you wanna look at the ordinance and then compare it to what you've been accused of. You really need to study your ticket. And most tickets are just that, just a short, probably no more than an eight and a half by 11 ticket. Now, if you get a warning, it should have all the same information, except it will not have a court date on it usually. Okay. All right, the next area we need to look at is reaching out to experts in the field. So you've asked for the law, you've read the law, you've read your citation, you've compared things, and now, and you know when you have to go to court if you have to, and you know you're going to plead not guilty to buy yourself some time. What now? Call your local. Do you have a local attorney? Do you have a gardener in the area who's an attorney? 
or you could contact perhaps one of us, the Wild Ones attorneys, and I'll get to that in just a minute. Reach out to local experts. Do you have an extension agency? Here in Iowa, we have Iowa State Extension. We have a lot of people and a lot of garden clubs that have dealt with this. Reach out to people in other garden clubs, other homeowners, perhaps. Network, call me. We're going to provide you a way to get a hold of me. But reach out to experts in the field. Don't feel that you're by yourself. And hopefully with the information I give you tonight, you'll have a good firm basis on how to stop and take a ticket from a bad experience into an experience where you can turn it into advocacy for your community. But just a note about the wild lawyers. And I, I just, I need to say this. We are a team and we're available to you to offer advice but we cannot represent individual members charged with violations. We can consult, we can look at your ticket, I can look at the law and give you some suggestions, but we can't actually represent you in the individual states. I wish I could, but unfortunately I'm just an Iowa licensed attorney. And as you heard Jim say, we have many, many chapters in over half the states, but please reach out to experts and we are always available to, to help you. So let's look at that city code I promised you all. All right, so I've taken out snippets of the current city of Sioux City code, and I've given you an overview of what, what it's gonna look like if you pull up your local code. Now, where do you find the weed control or where do you find these, these um, any of these ordinances that might apply to you. Well, hopefully, as I said before, your ticket has the number, okay? Here, we have found it under streets and sidewalks, which is called Title 17. And under Title 17, the city of Sioux City has placed a subsection is what we call it. And this subsection is chapter 17, Point three two, and we see weed control on there. Now, if you don't know what section you're charged with, you really need to push the issue because if you don't know what section, it's sometimes difficult to find the proper area. And I'll give you an example. Most of us, we would say weed control if we're talking about a weed. That's not always the case. I'll give you a perfect example. Once again, when I was the city of Sioux City attorney, we would write tickets for, for dog owners who would allow their pet to go to the bathroom on somebody's lawn or their parking area. And if the dog went poo and they didn't pick it up, that could be a citation. And we gave citations often people would say, they would call in and say, my neighbor's dog keeps going to the bathroom on my lawn. What code is that? Or I can't find in the city ordinances. And I thought there was a law. And I would say there is. And they said, but I've searched it all the way you can search it. You know, most, most city codes have a search bar at the top. We're all used to searching things on Google and Amazon and all those places. Well, but terminology is important people would look up every derivative of poo and they wouldn't find it because in the city code, it was defecate. The dog defecated and nobody ever thought of that word. So it is important that you know the exact chapter because for some reason, if somebody decides not to use the word weed control, you may be looking for a very long time, okay? So it's very important, but here it's pretty easy weed control. Now I do want to put one caveat out and that is I have been gone for almost 10 years from the city of uh, Sioux City. So I do not take any responsibilities. I rewrote the code, but several sections, including this section has been rewritten. So I am not the current author of this section. And I'm going to point out something important about that in just a minute, but every section should have a table of contents. Now, we're all familiar with table of contents when we read books. It's something we're taught when we begin reading in school. So the first thing you want to look at when you pull up a code is the table of contents, like the coming attractions. And I've pulled those out for you. So if we look at these, it's 
duties of owners to control weeds, criteria, notice, failure to cut weeds, assessment against property, and penalty for violations. The first thing that pops out to me, and I confirmed it after doing some more research, was there's no definition section. Now, we all know what definitions are. Go to the dictionary to look up the definition of a word. And a really well-written law or ordinance should always have a section that contains definitions. So for instance, we really want to know what a weed is, don't we? And that's an error in the current code we're going to be looking at tonight. Nowhere in the city of Sioux City's ordinances is weed defined. Nowhere. So if somebody says you have a weed, I would argue you don't because we don't know what a weed is. I've looked at other municipalities and they actually define the word weed. So this is the very first thing you need to look at is the definitional section. It's entirely possible that you have a citation about a weed. And when you go and you look at the definition of weed, which I hope you have in your code, you'll look and say, my goodness, that's not at all what the flower I have. My flower is a cultivated wildflower, blah, blah, blah. And it clearly does not fit in the definition of a weed. And right there would be the perfect defense for you to be able to have the ticket dismissed against you. So these subheadings are very important. And I always want you to look for a definitional section. What is a weed in Sioux City is not probably what a weed is in Casper, Wyoming, or New York, New York, okay? Weed doesn't have one, one giant category. Now, there are some uniform laws, and I know there are some uniform suggestions about what is a weed, but unless those are ad adopted specifically by the municipality, those definitions are not used. It's the definition that is in the code that that city, state, county has adopted. So that's number one. All right, so let's take a look at some of these things. The very first section here is duties of owners to control weeds. All right, it is unlawful for the owner or owners of each lot and parcel of ground within the corporate limits of the city to fail, refuse, or neglect to cut or destroy all weeds, vines, brush, or other growth and debris which constitute a health, safety, or fire hazard on said lots, parcels of ground, or on fronting or abutting streets and alleys. Woo, that's a lot, okay? Let's unpack this one, shall we? All right, if your ticket says that you are in violation of 17.32.010, you need to look at this carefully. Number one, it is unlawful for the owner or owners. Okay, what if you're a renter? Should you be getting the ticket? The answer is no. Actually, it should be going to the landlord. Number one, of each lot and parcel of ground within the corporate limits of the city. Okay, the next question I would say is, is your address, is the lot in question within the corporate limits. If it's not, that's another reason for the citation to be dismissed. To fail, refuse, neglect, to cut or destroy all weeds, vines, brush, or other growth. Once again, I would say, what is a weed? What is a vine and what is brush? Growth and debris. We don't know, okay? We don't know what that is. And then lastly, which constitute a health, safety, or fire hazard. Once again, what if you do have some plants or flowers, but in your opinion, they are not constituting a health, safety, or fire hazard. Right now, it's very dry here in Iowa, and I have 10 acres of what I would think is very dry short grass that if I struck a match, it would be a fire hazard. So it's pretty hard to say fire hazard when if you're extremely in a drought and you have extreme moisture loss, anything could be on fire. So 
So you could also argue, I have these flowers, but they don't constitute a health, safety, or fire hazard. I think you can start to see why it's really important that you ask the municipality, why have I gotten this citation? Because if we just look at this 1732010, this first part of the weed control code, there's lots of things here that could not apply and therefore the ticket could be, you could argue should be dismissed. Let's move down to criteria 020. It shall be presumed that a health, fire or safety hazard exists when weeds or other growth on any portion of a lot or parcel, parcel are in excess of 12 inches in length. So here we have a little bit of a definition to help us out with the previous verbiage about health, safety, or fire hazard. And we also have a little bit of a definition because we're told anything over 12 inches in length could be an issue. So here's a little bit of a help, but still it's not super clear to me. There's lots of holes here for a defense attorney to come in and say, also presumed is a strong word that I would argue perhaps you could overcome as well with some evidence. So the first two sections, let's keep going. All right, section 30 is all about notice. How do you get or receive that citation I told you about? Well, I'm not gonna read this in, de in depth, but I will tell you that subsection one talks about when the city manager is gonna publish the requirements for the notice and how they're going to deliver it to you and what the notice should say. And the second part of this says that the notice shall specifically state that as to grasses growing over 12 inches tall, no further notice will be given to the property owner. So here there is some specificity required about what's in the ticket that you receive. I think it's important that you look for these notice requirements when you receive your ticket. If you receive a ticket and somebody says you have to have this done by tomorrow, I bet there's a part of the local code that doesn't require that. And if you notice here on subsection two, there's two other parts that says, how are you gonna be notified by placing a postcard or a placard in a, con in a conspicuous place or by regular mail? And then they're gonna tell you how long you have to abate this, okay? Here it's, uh, you have to abate the gross within seven days of the date stated on the placard. Now I want you to know that these dates, though they're usually in a code, there is some flexibility if you reach out to the attorney in charge. Let's say for instance, it's an elderly homeowner and they do need to cut down some weeds. Let's say there are some noxious weeds involved. If there is a reason why there needs to be an extension, I can tell you that most attorneys that are in charge of this will grant extensions. But once again, you have to ask for them. But first and foremost, know what the timetable is. And you don't, you don't wanna call on the seventh day. You wanna try to call as soon as you know that you're going to need some sort of an extension. Now, Failure to cut weeds here in this part of the code, okay, they talk about if you fail to cut the weeds, the city will have somebody come in and cut the weeds for you and assess that fine, that, that expense and a fine. Now, this is a hot topic with a lot of homeowners because number one, if you don't do it, the city has somebody come onto your property. They cut everything in sight. I will tell you that usually the charge is excessive, usually more than the going rate. And then that is assessed against your property taxes in addition to whatever the, the municipal fine is. So what could you be looking for if you ignore one of these citations? In Sioux City, you could be looking at anywhere between $250 and $500. These can get quite expensive. So once again, you want to make sure that you're communicating with that attorney so you don't you don't receive one of these these bills on top of it. Now, I skipped a couple of slides here uh, 
that were that were more uh, formality about going to court. But I do want to bring up as we conclude here the the weed the control code that is the penalty for violations. And so here you'll see what the the violation here is, and it says any person who violates any provisions of this chapter, it's a municipal infraction, it's it's a misdemeanor, and it's subject to a mandatory civil penalty of $100 for the first offense, $200 for the second and subsequent violations, and they consider that in a 365-day calendar year. If they are not paid, they are turned in against your property taxes. And so it is something on top of your property taxes. And I can tell you that I had people with several of these, these violations and they were assessed. And if you go to sell your home, you can't sell your home. It's a lien against your home. If somebody is trying to, to buy it or you're trying to sell it, you, got, you have to pay those off. So it can really, it can, it can stop a closing. Uh, very easily. And so you'll notice that most municipalities, Sioux City included, they include first and second violations and they increase that level. I also wanted to point out that if your local municipality does not have a weed control section, they also may write you a ticket under the nuisance code. Now, the nuisance code, there is one in Sioux City, it's under chapter eight, it's actually 8.72.080. And a nuisance is really anything that's offensive to your senses, the five senses. And on the Sioux City code, they do give you some examples of nuisances. So diseased animals running at large, stagnant pools of water, carcasses of animals. And you'll see number six, all weeds, vines, brush, or other growth, which we're back to that, constitutes a health, safety, or fire hazard. So even if you don't have a weed ordinance, be aware that you may be written a ticket under the nuisance code. But I redirect you back to the definition argument, which is if you review this code here in Sioux City, we don't know what a weed is, so that would be a big defense if you received one of these tickets. Finally, I would like to recognize that the city of Sioux City, I did, I searched the entire code preparing for this evening, and I did find that they do mention native planting. And that is under site development and buffering. This is actually in the part of the city code that developers use. And they are, there is some language here about native vegetation that I thought was interesting. And under 250560 purpose, it stated the purpose of this division is to establish landscaping standards that preserve native vegetation, that contribute to the natural character of the city, enhance the appearance and character of the city, improve the compatibility of budding, of budding uses, and protect the ecological and recreational value of the city's beautiful natural resources. And here in this section, I found it very interesting. If you look, we do have definitions of landscaping, buffer yards, and tells you a little bit more. So if I received today, if the phone rang and I had a client, uh, a concerned gardener, a, a fellow gardener say, I've received this ticket from the city of Sioux City. I would really stress that we don't have a definition of weed and that actually the city supports native vegetation because they mention it in another part of the code under site development. And obviously the city would like to preserve native vegetation and this would be an example of it. So that would be the legal argument that I would probably take forward as a defense for my client. So with that, I'd like to recap briefly. If the weed police come knocking on your door, the number one rule always is don't panic, time out. Don't get the weed whacker out. Don't get the lawnmower out because with a little bit of diplomacy and a little bit of imagination and a little bit of knowledge of the law, which I hope you all have now, you can turn that ticket into advocacy. And I know so many of you out there 
are saying to me, how can I move the needle? How can I get this changed? And I am an, I am a Iowa lobbyist. I, I do lobbying for family law. And so I've learned over the last three years as an active lobbyist in Des Moines, when I travel three hours from my home to the state capitol, that it's not about here today, gone tomorrow, changing the law. Changing laws take time, okay? Changing laws are like a marathon and not a sprint. Or as we like to use in the lobbying, and when I have my lobbying hat on, it's about moving the needle. And oftentimes, moving the needle with the people that are in charge of the needle here, city administrators, county officials, people who are going to write those laws, moving the needle involves education first. Now, I, I'm the first to admit I have some native plants in my acreage and they don't look so good all year round. Okay, they don't. But we have to wait till July or August when they bloom. Maybe it just is going to take a little bit of time to meet with your local representatives, your city manager, you know, your version of the county guy that knocks on the door and say, do you really understand about native plants? Do you understand that they go through this process where here they don't look good, but here they do, that they do get a certain, a certain length or a certain height? but then they're gonna bloom and be very beautiful. Education is where you start. That's where the needle begins to move everyone is by educating. And I don't want anybody to be afraid to be an advocate. Anybody can be an advocate. I've seen small children be advocates and I've seen 90 year old women to be advocates. When I worked for the city, I had a passionate group of ladies who wanted me to rewrite the animal uh, animal control and animal cruelty penalties for the city of Sioux City. We spent a year and a half meeting once or twice a month. They brought their ideas to me. They told me why. I did the legal research. I put language together. We went to the city council. We went back to the committee and we had one of the very first laws in the state, actually in the nation, that addressed animal cruelty at a local level but they had to educate us because not even I thought we needed the law until I received some education. So if you have an HOA, if you have local municipalities, if you have state or whatever your situation is, start not with, I'm so upset I have a ticket, but start as an opening, start that conversation. And that's where you can use the wild ones. We have so many resources here. And you can consult myself or anyone with, you know, what kind of powerful information can you tell somebody? And let's take, as I wrap up here, a very basic thing, something I dealt with many, many times. Neighbor A would call me about neighbor B. And they would say, neighbor, neighbor A would say, neighbor B's yard is blah, blah, whatever the complaint was. And I would say, have you gone over and spoken to them? Have you asked them why it looks like that? So here's, here's another quick uh, tip I like to give everybody when we talk about this subject is maybe it's just a sign. You know, you can have lots of signs. There's lots of uh, cricket cutters and all these cute things you can have made. Have a beautiful, cute sign made for your wild, wild ones, uh, wildflower patch that says, wild ones in process, come back in July for the bloom just something really cute, wildflowers under construction. And a lot of times something like that, or even taking your plantings and making it with a border around it, just something that highlights it to tell people, this is a different planting. Something like that can be offered up and explain it to neighbor B and neighbor A backs off. These are also things that you can propose if you have a ticket or a warning, okay, I understand that my planting is 20 feet long and 18 feet wide. Maybe I need to put some, some mulch around that, or maybe I need to cut it back and put some river rock around that. Would that help? Would that, would that meet those requirements? So please don't view these tickets as you're marching right into court for this adversarial battle. Instead, see it as an opportunity, as a time to educate your local officials, 
and move that needle so that wild flowers, native plants, all of those people, people can learn to enjoy the beauty and we can do one of our major missions and our goals, which is to spread the knowledge and hopefully reestablish native planting all throughout the United States. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Jim for some housekeeping before we go ahead and take some questions. Thank you, Roseanne, that was really terrific. And um, I can assure you folks, uh, really as an attorney, uh, she, she gave you excellent advice. <clears throat> so um, a little bit of, uh, before we start the Q&A with Roseanne, uh, please check the description below for a link to our post-event survey. We ask that you please fill this out at the end of tonight's presentation. Your honest feedback greatly helps us improve our webinar experience for future events. The survey link will also be mailed to all of you following this webinar. If you enjoyed tonight's presentation, do not miss the upcoming three-part webinar series in April on native plants for stormwater, air quality, and soil contamination with Eric Fuselet, also a Wild Ones National Board member. Now let's welcome back Roseanne to answer some of the questions that were submitted at the time of the registration. And if Roseanne would turn back on your, uh, there you are. Okay, so we're going to go through these now. Um, okay, um, and let me uh, remind everybody that um, when we're done with this Q&A, Roseanne's gonna have her special surprise announcement that you will all very much like to hear. So um, Roseanne, uh, one of the questions was, um, how do you suggest we get the media involved so um, our mission can get a uh, wider public understanding? Well, that, that's a great question. And I can tell you, this is a great time of year to, to work on this. So if you have a local garden group or just have a local or just a group of garden friends, the media is always looking for education, public interest types of stories especially if it's seasonal. And as we're going into the spring and the summer months, I think this is the perfect time to reach out. And this can be your local newspaper. This can be your local TV station, even your radios. I can tell you we have a radio station here up in Lamar's, Iowa, and I've made friends with the news director and he is so supportive of gardening. And whenever we have anything you know, a lot of these uh, smaller municipalities, they have, they're bringing them back now that COVID's over. They have a around the town or, or, you know, Tuesday tidbits. I've seen them named all sorts of things. They're always looking for special guests. And so I would say, don't be afraid to get out there, do a press release. It doesn't have, you don't have to be, you don't have to have a, a journalism degree or work for CNN or Fox. Okay. A press release is just a a couple lines put together about what you want to talk about. And I think it's important, especially if you have a wild ones chapter, that's perfect. Get your president, get your PR person, whoever out there to talk about native plants, your native plant sales. I know many of our chapters have sales. And I think those are all once again, opportunities to educate your community about the beauty and how necessary native plants are. And so I would say reach out to anybody and anybody that will listen, volunteer to be on these shows. Some of them are still doing it through Zoom like we are tonight, but that's how I would get the media involved. Also, if you do garden walks, invite the media to your garden walk. If it's a slow news night, you might be the top story. Yeah, excellent. I was thinking about garden walks and it's true. Um, the media, they have pages to fill, they have, um, time they've got to fill fill their slots and so uh, I think you'll be able to get them get them out there um, shifting gears now um, let's say that someone had a citation and for whatever reason it, it went to the court initially or to the whatever the adjudication panel was and now it's about a year later let's say and um, uh, because the person for whatever reason, didn't follow your advice tonight. Uh, are there any strategies, um, you know, uh, that they can do after such a delay, or, uh, or you know, anything you can offer? Yes. So, just to separate a couple of things. So here we use the word. I know the question used the word appeal, and that that is different than 
a default uh, judgment, which I mentioned that if you don't know your court date and you don't know what to do and you just you just sort of freeze and you think, and this happens to a lot of people, I'm going to put this in a drawer and maybe it'll magically disappear. It, it won't because when you don't come to court, it's called a default judgment and you're you're found guilt you're found guilty by default. You just don't come to court, and those those are that's a done deal. It's a lost cause. There's not much you can do but to pay the citation, and you'll probably hear the the rev of the lawnmower coming to cut your plants down at some point too. An appeal is when you've actually been to court and you don't like the decision and you believe there's been an error made by the judge here. We'd be talking about a judge. And then you'd have to go to the next level. So in a lot of these things, you'd be going to the district court and appeals are very difficult because you actually, an appeal is not, I'm mad about the decision. The appeal is, I believe the judge has made a wrong decision. And if the county, the state, whoever the prosecutor was, had a pretty good case against you, you're probably not going to win on appeal. Plus, they're going to want you to have an appeal bond. And it's just a big, hairy mess. And also what people don't understand without, once again, taking everybody to law school here, is that an appeal cannot introduce new evidence. So a lot of people say, oh, but, but, but here's something new. An appeal is what we call a de novo review, which Jim and I know what that is. But what that is, is that you can only look at what was entered at the original trial. You can't bring new stuff in. So I would really say that, number one, I would never appeal a weed citation. Just I would never do that. And number two, get to it first. Get Address it right away and, and get some help because that is going to be the, the quickest and the best way to deal with that weed citation. Yeah, let me add that sometimes uh, if there is a default, in other words, for whatever reason you didn't get the notice or you got scared and didn't follow Roseanne's advice, there might be a period where you can undo the default uh, and then you're back to square one. Um, the, if you have a default or if you've lost and, and the time to reverse the default is gone, the problem with an appeal is that you may not even be able to challenge it at all or argue there was no definition of weeds because that's been foreclosed by the fact that you have a default that can't be undone or you forgot, or you didn't say it in court. So there's exactly. an, appeal, an appeal is a very, very narrow window. So right. don't even think about trying to rely on it. No, and I would say that when people ask me about default times, I would say days, not weeks. You know, yeah. I would say, I mean, I don't know, Jim, you, you and I practice in different states, but, you know, default here in district courts, about seven to 10 working days. They were a little more, generous during COVID, but I have seen it now back to the seven to 10 days. And that's really in the judge's discretion. Yeah, I guess the point I was simply making was just because there's been a default doesn't mean you're necessarily lost. There might be a grace period, but you need to get on it right away. Absolutely. Okay, we've we've had a number of questions come up um, before tonight and even um, asked of the wild lawyers about the um, International Property Maintenance Code. Uh, folks have said, well, we, we need to change the definition of weeds in the IPMC. Um, what, do you have any opinion on that one, Roseanne? Well, yes. Well, first of all, I, I just want to make sure everybody knows what the IPMC is. And that is, it's a model ordinance. So I always teach my students when I start in business law that there, there are four ways we get laws in America. We have the constitution, we have statutes, we have common law, okay? Uh, and then we have constitutional law. So if the model ordinances are fall under the statutory, uh, uh, statutory uh, creation of law. So who creates statutes? Well, your state, your local and your federal legislators do but also under this umbrella are experts in the field, people that are super smart in certain areas, they get together and they write these model codes. Now there's a model code for everything now, model fire code, model jurisdiction, model child custody, you name it, there is a model code. But the code itself is not law, it has to be adopted by some of those legislators. So for instance, when I was working for the city of Sioux City and I rewrote the fire, part of our city ordinance, I wrote in and copied, okay, it's okay, copied the model fire code. 
And so here's the deal. This IPMC, okay, is a model code which municipalities may adapt and adopt into the law, which we talked about tonight. So as you can see, the, the city of Sioux City, they have not adopted that in, the, in what I've showed you this evening. So changing the definition of weed with these folks is you would have to go to the experts in the field and once again, begin your advocacy, your lobbying efforts, like I said, and you would have to show them, here is the reason I think that the definition of weed should be changed. That's a pretty tall order. I'm not saying it can't ever be done, but it's gonna take some national organizations with some pretty strong lobbyists in probably years. And I mean years to change that if you can ever even get it done. So I don't get too much, don't get too bogged down by this model rule. It's out there, but unless your locality has adopted it, it doesn't really apply to you. That, that yeah, was my commentary on it. Sure, uh, I'll add, um, because I've looked at this because the question has actually been addressed to us. Uh, some Wild Ones members thought we need to change the definition of weeds. And actually, in Section 302.4 of the IPMC, uh, it says that uh, the term weeds shall not include cultivated flowers and gardens. So Roseanne and I would argue that uh, your native uh, plant garden is, is cultivated and therefore not a weed. That's right. And that goes back to that, that heavy right. emphasis I placed on the definition right. in my exactly. speech here, which is you've got to look at those definitions because that alone may solve your problem right there. Exactly. But um, as I've come across in, in answering questions, the IPMC does include insects in its definition of pests and includes tree branches, yard trimmings, and similar materials. Uh, we don't know if that includes leaf litter or not in its definition of rubbish. And as, as we all know, as native gardeners, having some of these materials in gardens constitutes customary and good native gardening uh, landscaping practices. And also, um, you know, insects are often very important in gardens. And so if, if any Wild Ones members want to do battle with the IPMC, you might want to look at the definition of uh, pests and, and rubbish uh, rather than weeds. And that, so, that and once again, that goes back to educating your neighbor who might be upset. I'm not leaving this here because I'm lazy or don't want to do it. I'm leaving this here so the bees have a home over the winter. Or what, Once you explain things to people, it really does help clarify why you're doing what you're doing. Exactly. And maybe um, you'll also get them to stop hiring their landscape crew to blow all their leaves off their yard and put mulch down. Maybe they'll That's save right. money by uh, leaving their, their uh, leaves on their property. So I mean, a couple of uh, ordinances that some of our uh, listeners have asked about that I think helps um, make some of the points that, that you've emphasized. Um, the, the Pierce County, Washington version of the um, IPMC says uh, lots shall be maintained free of grass, weed, and other plant growth in excess of 12 inches in length. Uh, trees, maintained shrubbery, and other maintained ornamental landscaping shall be exempt. So what, what say you, Roseanne? What say me? Well, I was the first thing on I, would, that? <laughs> I do. Well, I would want to know what ornamental landscaping is, Jim, yep, because once again, exactly. I know this is like a broken record, but I'm telling you, if they don't have ornamental landscaping defined, I would say my switchgrass is ornamental landscaping. My cone flowers are ornamental landscaping. So that was that's where I would start right there is what is ornamental landscaping because that could be huge. Absolutely right. <clears throat> There's a somebody mentioned a hedge ordinance. All existing hedges and new hedges and or plantings hereafter grown in violation of the provisions of this chapter are public nuisance. This goes to the nuisance mm -hmm. point. The ordinance defines hedge as a barrier. So what's our defense here, Roseanne? Well, a couple of things. One, I want to know what a barrier is. Once again, definition, definition. And number two, um, where they say all existing hedges and new hedges or plantings hereafter grown in violation of provisions of this chapter of public nu nuisances. Well, first of all, if you have something existing, you're okay. 
Okay, because it specifically says, uh, oh, I'm sorry, all existing hedges in new, oh, they did exclude, excuse me. That's well, that's, okay. I would still argue, I would still argue that because here is the deal. Most laws, this is what I, I remember reading this, most laws are forward facing, right. okay? You can't say X is a crime. Oh, and by the way, now I'm gonna go chase after the 22 people that I know did that five years ago. Okay, so I, I think one of my defenses here, especially if I have an existing hedge, is going to be, um, I think that's unconstitutional. And here's the deal. These local ordinances can be unconstitutional. That is a, that's a real high level thing. But I want to tell you, when I was a city attorney, we had a local ordinance that said a train could not block the train tracks for more than 10 minutes. And we had a determined elderly citizen who kept pestering <laughs> us. And wanted the train to receive a ticket. And I told the then city manager in Sioux City, there was no way we could write a ticket because as Jim knows, that that's unconstitutional. It's a commerce clause. It's it's law school con law 101. And that that you cannot you cannot write a law, the city, the city or county or state that violates the commerce clause. The feds always win. Well, guess what? We wrote the ticket. We had a trial. These big fancy men came from the railroad. We told the little old man that, and, and that was the end of it. But you can have an unconstitutional local ordinance, which I then said, we need to get that repealed. Obviously it's bad. So there's another thing is, as I might look at the constitutionality of saying, oh, all those existing ones count. And then I would also wanna know what, like I said, what's a barrier? I mean, cause most hedges I know they, they trim something out. They're not, it's not like an English country garden where it's, it's the forge around the castle or something. Most of them have some sort of entryway, which I would say that's not a barrier. So I think there's a lot of things there you could pick apart. Absolutely. I, I totally agree. So now what happens if it's not your uh, weed police, but your neighbors mm -hmm. don't understand what you're, what you're growing or native plants and, um, and then they don't understand why you're leaving your, your leaves on your garden in order to leave habitat over the winter. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> any advice for this homeowner who, who's dealing with their neighbors? Yes. Uh, find out what they like to eat. Uh, <laughs> they like chocolate chip cookies, pie, whatever. And go make a friend and say, you, you know, uh, I understand you have some concerns. Or maybe if you hear from another neighbor, there's a concern, just walk over. Or remember the old uh, Tim, the two man Taylor, you know, he had Wilson over the fence or whatever. Be a Wilson, put your head over the fence and say, boy, I'd like to show you my native plantings. And this is why we do things. And I really, once again, you always get more bees with honey than vinegar, the old saying goes. Don't be upset or mad just say you know this is how you take care of a native plant bed or this is why I do this or this is my my maybe maybe your children are doing it for 4-H or some kind of agricultural project and you just need to explain you know little Bobby's doing it for this reason so once again I've said definition 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 but I am here I would say educate 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 which is Another part of the Wild One's mission is to educate folks and tell them why you're doing what you're doing. Cutesy signs, maybe put a border around it. I would, all of those things, all of those things, just don't get angry right away with the neighbor. Yeah, agreed. Your, your local Wild One's chapter may have signage that, that uh, could be very helpful. Absolutely. I've seen some great signs, you know, wildflowers under construction or really cute you know, identifiers or wildflower, uh, maybe the wild ones I know of chapter that does, you know, the yard of the week, maybe you're the yard of the week and you have something up just so they know that there's a reason behind it. And uh, <clears throat> the uh, wild store is going to be opening up again soon. So maybe we'll, we can sell some more of uh, yes. these clever signs you're suggesting. So let's go to the last one here. Um, this, re this person says my small municipality had created some guidelines, but in the words of the planning department, quote, it all depends on if a neighbor complains, close quote. Yes. What do you think we should do with that one? Well, I, okay, so this, 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 is, this is very common in municipalities. 
So I will tell you that being the prosecutor of the for the weed police, as I said before, it was not my top duty and I did not enjoy it. How did I get these tickets? I can tell you that in this day and age, with the shortage of workers and the amount of work on our municipalities and our, our local places with COVID and just all of the things that are crushing down on everybody right now, that there is probably not somebody 100% dedicated to looking for weeds. Okay, so 35 years ago in Sioux City, there used to be a sidewalk guy. All he did was walk the sidewalks and see if you had a crack in your sidewalk. And if you did, you got a citation and a fix it ticket. Okay, 35 years ago. That man hasn't been in existence for 34 and a half. Okay, when he retired, they never replaced him. One, they, they didn't want to pay him. But number two, there were so many other things for inspectors to do. So what we instituted at the city of Sioux City, and I think this is really common to all municipalities, small, big, large, and in between, is it's complaint driven, okay? There's not going to be somebody driving around probably looking at your weeds out with the tape measure, measuring your, your you know, four o'clocks or whatever you have out there. It normally, I would say 99% of the tickets that I dealt with when I was a city attorney were complaint based, which means we don't send somebody out unless neighbor, like I said, be nice to your neighbor, unless that neighbor called and said, you know, the Joneses across the street are growing this crazy stuff and I don't like the look of it, blah, blah, blah. And then that generates the ticket. So when they say, when this question says it depends on if the neighbor complains, that's what they mean. It's complaint driven. So if you have the proverbial neighbor who kind of doesn't have anything to do and they're just kind of nosy, you may have a lot more trouble than the person who has a huge native plant uh, area, but the neighbor thinks it's grand. They're never going to call. They're going to nominate you for yard of the week and that you're over here fighting to, to keep your four o'clocks alive. So once again, I'm telling you, educate, educate, educate. You don't want that neighbor to call because then, and then I'm going to warn you too, once they call, then you're on the radar. And then they come back and they check on you. A lot of time, those inspectors. So you don't, you don't want that call to be made. So that's, that's what they mean by that is they don't have time to do it. It's complaint driven and you don't want to be on the complaint list. Right. But again, if you have that neighbor that just can't be um, convinced that na your native garden is uh, beautiful and beneficial, then you would say to the city uh, employee, okay, show me, show me the ordinance. Show me I the law. I have yeah. a neighbor. It can't just be that a neighbor is complaining. There has to be something in the ordinance that I'm violating. And if Correct. if you don't have it, then you've just got a, a neighbor uh, to, to deal with. But it's not a, an ordinance violation. No, so I think we're going to think we're going to wrap this up now. Uh, okay, Roseanne, you have uh, a special announcement or or two, I think, to give to our. our I do. Well, go ahead. I do. I do. So. Uh, this, this topic came out of, we have monthly meetings, the wild lawyers, and this topic came out of conversation and, and an idea I had and, and questions that we received. And so as we were preparing this presentation and the questions came in and we had our meeting last month, I have volunteered since I have ordinance experience, ordinance creation experience that I'd like to officially announce we received many questions and requests for a model code that would address native plantings that you could take to your local municipality as an advocate and propose that it be adopted into the city code at a certain point. Now, I'll be working on this over the next several months and hope to have a draft sometime in the fall. Uh, ordinance writing is not something you sit down and do overnight. So when I do write ordinances, I do look at ordinances across the United States. Uh, when I write laws for Iowa, I look at laws from across the United States as well. And it takes time to craft them. It is actually, it is actually a skill and a craft putting together, as I said, an ordinance or sample ordinances. Language has to be specific. You have to look at the totality of it. You have to look at how it would work in the, in the local laws. 
So I am challenging and requesting help from all those native gardeners out there listening tonight and on the replay. If you have a code that you have found helpful, I would love to see it. On the other hand, if you have a code that you have found to be not helpful or you have unfortunately been a victim of, some people like to say, I would also like to see that. And we have a specific place we'd like you to send those to me so I can make sure I find them all. We have a native plant group here through the Wild Ones. It's a Facebook group, Facebook members only group, okay? But it's native plant group. And if people can drop good, the good, the bad, and the ugly in there, I will begin to shift through them as I work on my summer project of putting together a sample ordinance. And then hopefully we can have another seminar perhaps on how to take it to your local municipality and be an advocate. And I can teach everybody how to be a lobbyist. So after I've had junior law school here, maybe I can teach lobbying 101. And that's our big announcement. In addition, I want to thank my Morningside College or Morningside University students. I have several of my students watching tonight for a project and they are waiting on a special password and the password is sunflower. So the code word or the password is sunflower. So that's our announcements tonight, Jim. Thank you, Roseanne, and good luck to your students. Thank you. Um, folks, uh, I know you can't wait for that model ordinance. We'll, we will get it done as soon as we can, and we will announce it when it's ready for prime time. It'll probably go up on the Wild Ones National website. So uh, please be give us your patience and uh, we'll tell you when it's ready. So if you don't hear from us, it means it's not ready. With that, I'm going to uh, thank you again, Roseanne, for a fabulous presentation. Thank all of you out there in Wild Ones land for uh, coming tonight and for listening on the, uh, on the recording. And um, have, a, have a great evening and uh, happy gardening. Thank happy you. gardening. Bye-bye.